Hello, my name is Jim Colafello, and I'm the Vice Dean of Academic and Student Affairs at the Ira Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges for Engineering Speaker Series, hosted by ASU and sponsored by the Kern Entrepreneurial Engineering Network. This engaging speaker series will focus on the 14 grand challenges for engineering in the 21st century. Esteemed speakers from across the nation will be sharing their expertise on these grand challenges and answering your questions. We are proud to be a part of the NAE Grand Challenge Scholars Program, preparing graduates to address these challenges. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Ramakrishna, the Director of the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge Scholars Program Network to share his welcome. Hello, my name is Ramakrishna and I am the Director of the National Academy of Engineering's Grand Challenge Scholars Program Network. The NAE Grand Challenges for Engineering identified in 2008 by a committee of the National Academy of Engineering are 14 critical global challenges for engineering in the 21st century, united by the mission of continuing life on the planet and making the world more sustainable, more healthy, more secure, and more joyful. The Grand Challenges Scholars Program, inspired by the NAE Grand Challenges, reflect the rapidly evolving nature of engineering education. The goal of the program is to prepare engineers who not only have the necessary technical skills, but also the cross-disciplinary knowledge, entrepreneurial spirit, the global multicultural perspective, and a sense of societal mission needed to meet the global grand challenges facing humankind in the 21st century. As of November 2018, 65 institutions across the US and around the world have implemented this innovative educational program, and nearly 100 are getting ready to join the consortium of GCSP schools. We at the National Academy of Engineering are thrilled that Arizona State University has taken the initiative to organize this series of presentations with, that will highlight each of the 14 NAE grand challenges and provide this valuable resource not only to its own students and faculty, but to students and faculty from around the world. On behalf of NAE, I'd like to thank ASU and the Kern Foundation for making the presentation series possible. I am we're eagerly looking forward to following how this series impacts and inspires the next generation to create solutions to our society's most daunting problems. Our best wishes for a successful series, and thank you very much. Yesterday it was 11 degrees and there was snow on my deck. So it's wonderful to see the blue skies. I'm really delighted to be here. I, uh, my lab, uh, though I'm a neuroscientist, I have a lot of bioengineers in my laboratory uh, and, and involved in capstone projects and graduate, uh, graduate program in bioengineering. And really this is a, a critical time uh, and a very exciting time for the whole field of neuroscience and engineering, and uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of buzz about what we might be able to do. Uh, but what I will try to get you excited about is some of the problems. And you know, you get into a field, and, you, and if you th thought that, uh, well, everything good has been done already, all the easy stuff is done. Well, you, they may be right about easy, but there's so much more to do. There's at least five Nobel Prizes out there waiting for someone uh, to be awarded because there are so many challenges in the field of neuroengineering and how, as some people would say, we uh, can hack the brain, uh, that, um, that you're going to see uh, lots of exciting things come down the pike. And uh, I really hope that all of you will uh, try to think not like your mentors, don't think like me, but think new thoughts. Give, give yourself uh, a, a, the chance to discover something new. So um, one of the, the problems, and I, I'll be talking about how we can use this new technology in uh, neurological disorders and diseases, and one of the problems we have is traumatic brain injury, and all of you probably know about 
uh, in football, for example, uh, head injuries are, uh, are really, uh, uh, have damaged a lot of lives. And not only the injury and the damage to the brain that occurs uh, initially by the insult, but uh, we're finding out that a lot of these former NFL players are disposed to, uh, predisposed to things like Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury. So there are really serious problems that we have no easy solution for. But, so you know, we all know about football, and I don't know if you know what sport uh, actually has the highest incidence of traumatic head injuries. Anybody know? Soccer, wrestling, well, all those are important, but here it is, cycling. Cycling injures more brains than any other sport. And uh, so uh, uh, wear your helmets, uh, don't fall on a rock. But this, uh, these are, uh, are very critical problems. We also injure our brains uh, in, uh, as part of our daily living, especially as people get older, although we're seeing younger and younger strokes. And so there are over 750,000 people a year in the US that have a stroke. That's about every 45 seconds someone has a stroke. And most people were getting really good at saving lives after stroke. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but even though most individuals survive, about half of them have permanent disabilities. Uh, and brain injury survivors uh, have limited function of arms or legs, uh, speech language problems, cognitive emotional problems. And there are, uh, as far as devices or ph uh, pharmacology, we really don't have much. So when someone has a stroke, for example, uh, we can talk about an acute and a chronic phase. And uh, uh, initially, if you get, uh, get to the hospital in time, and what is in time, well, it used to be three hours, now they've expanded that to at least four and a half, maybe even up to six hours after a known onset. Well, not everybody knows that they had a stroke. Sometimes people w uh, have strokes in the middle of the night and wake up, and if you can't identify when they had it, it actually can be dangerous to introduce drugs, clot busters, uh, something called tissue plasminogen activator. It can be given intravenously or uh, uh, and uh, intraarterially to break up the clot. The blood flow is returned to the brain, and it really is a bit of a miracle that we now can save so many lives and restore function if you get in early enough. And there are a lot of people working on devices, actually retrieval devices to, to get the clot out. Um, we don't have a lot uh, of effort that goes into the rehabilitation phase, although people get maybe a, a week or so of rehabilitation in the hospital, and then they're left to go home. So people like me, uh, we're really interested in what we can do for people that have already had those strokes. The, as I like to say, when someone has a brain injury, it's not uh, a normal brain with a hole taken out. It's a completely rewired system, and I spent my life showing that the rest of the brain reorganizes in very specific ways. So can we reopen the window of opportunity? So either with physical therapy uh, or with drugs and devices, uh, can we, uh, we accelerate the recovery process? Now, uh, this is, uh, Jeff alluded to, uh, a, a paper we published long ago in Science that really set the stage for understanding uh, that the, the, when there's an injury to the brain, uh, that it changes. And uh, it, in everybody's brain here, that we have a representation of the hand shown here in red. And um, if uh, and an animal or a human has an injury to that part of the brain, uh, the rest of the hand area kind of shrinks back and uh, it's taken over by elbow and shoulder territories. But if you repetitively use the limb, and in this technique, it's a, a technique called constraint-induced movement therapy, force the individual to use that limb in repetitive tasks, then that hand area is maintained and can even expand. And so even though that's a really uh, kind of focal view, we've uh, zeroed in on just the hand area, it taught us that the rest of the brain actually can respond to physical therapy. And that's very important because it says that we can actually change, uh, change the brain after injury. Um, we have lots of technologies that have been around for a long time. Here's one uh, that you may have heard about 
uh, deep brain stimulation, specifically for Parkinson's disease. And this is actually, if any of uh, you have not, have not heard of this procedure, it's actually done under local anesthesia because the neurosurgeon wants to know if they're in an area uh, that's important. They want to they damage an important area, like uh, the control speech. So they drive this electrode down into, uh, deep down into the brain, into this little almond-shaped structure, um, in this case, the, the so-called subthalamic nucleus. And you can stimulate that area, and someone that has uh, movement disorders, such as tremors, um, uh, uh, have, uh, can see immediate alleviation of the tremors. So it's really nice for the neurosurgeon. They find the right spot, um, and there's a lot that goes into finding the right spot and recording physiological signals. But once you're there, um, you can, uh, this is an individual, just as an example, uh, this individual has a deep brain stimulator, but it's turned off. And he's trying to write his name, and uh, he's, you, uh, you, actually it looks better than my signature, but it's, it's for him, that's not very good. And he's trying to make circles, he puts his hands up to his face, and there are tremors, it's on both sides, so both uh, uh, the, uh, the electrode is actually implanted into both sides of his brain. Uh, and this is very common. There's a specific frequency for these tremors. Uh, and now the essential tremor with the deep brain stimulation on, tremor goes away immediately. And so this is another seemingly miracle cure. It's not a cure. It actually keeps that individual from taking more drugs. They can take less uh, L-DOPA, the drug that's given. I mean, look at his name now with the stimulator on. He can actually write his name. He's really functional now. And you know, I, uh, we have lots and lots of other examples uh, of uh, the, uh, and uh, one of the oldest though, and I would actually bring this up because I wanna, uh, I'd want to identify a couple of aspects that are challenges to this field. Um, you may have heard of cochlear implants, and this is for people that usually that have had uh, a hearing and they lost it, uh, and, some, and these can even be put into children. And uh, so the auditory nerve, that uh, yellow hearing nerve that's labeled here, uh, is stimulated because the cochlea, which has the auditory receptors, uh, it's shaped like a, a shell. And so if you coil a wire with electrodes on it into that area, you can stimulate the auditory nerve directly. Now, uh, the, and it's really amazing, and this is actually probably one of the most important lessons about the brain that I'm gonna tell you. So if you wanted to reproduce speech, well, we hear roughly in the range of, you know, maybe down to 20 hertz or so up to 20,000 hertz. And uh, there are a lot of nerve fibers uh, carrying that information. So if one wanted to, in a sense, re-engineer the brain, you could just transfer the acoustic signals into electrical signals, stimulate uh, each of those nerve endings, and replicate the kind of signal that goes up into the brain. Well, it turns out that the first cochlear implants only had about eight channels. And even today, some of the 16 and 32 channels, they work. How do they work with only 32 channels and you have all of these different nerves, uh, uh, 30,000 nerves or so, uh, uh, the, uh, the nerve uh, fibers in the auditory nerve of the human, it's about 30,000. So how does that work? Well, it turns out that everything, our perception of our auditory world, our visual world, it's really created by our brains. So it's kind of incidental that we have, that we have uh, these sounds that arrive uh, to our auditory nerves and we translate it, our brains translate it into something meaningful, like speech. Um, our vision, we don't, our, our eyes don't see in three dimensions. It takes two eyes and it takes brain processes to convert that information into a three-dimensional world. So that three-dimensional world that we see, it's, it's actually a fabrication of our brains. We do pretty well, even though we're limited in our bandwidth for hearing and vision. If you think about um, our, our vision, we're so proud of the fact that we as humans have such great color vision, but we don't see 
into the ultraviolet. A honeybee does. So honeybees see a completely different world than us. So the point about this is not comparative biology, but for you to understand that the brain does the work for us. So rather than having to reproduce the stimulation on every one of those 30,000 nerve fibers and do it in some coding, temporal coding, that would make sense to the brain, the brain figures it out. So even with an eight-channel system, the first cochlear implants, individuals could not really understand the speech very well. As they practiced, their brain started to figure it out and they started to have understandable speech. So um, this is actually, this is a cross-section through an auditory nerve. Note the, uh, the, air, the scale bar, 250 microns. If we zoom in on individual nerve fibers and even higher, you see that they're about uh, you know, five microns or so, a little bit more in diameter. So if one wanted to, instead of running this electrode into the cochlea, section the, the nerve and stimulate with some type of optimal spatial device, what have we got? Well, turns out we don't have electrodes yet that are that small enough to discreetly stimulate each one of those nerve fibers. The DBS electrode that we talked about, it's about a, a millimeter and a half. So think about that. Uh, 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 and, the, uh, and the ones we use experimentally are actually much smaller. They may be 15 microns or so on their surface. So let's take that experimental 15 micron electrode, put it on our auditory nerve. We're still stimulating multiple fibers. We, if we want to use stimulation in the brain, uh, to uh, actually cause percepts. It's not going to be natural just because of the scaling factor, but this is a technological problem. There's also technological problems with leaving these in for long periods of time, being able to record signals and stimulate over the lifetime of an individual. So there, those technical hurdles, no doubt, will be solved, and they'll be solved probably in the next, certainly in your lifetime. Um, now, because we have such a push in technology, and there are a number of entrepreneurs out there that want to see this happen, things are, may be happening rapidly as far as the engineering side goes. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Neuralink, but that's Elon Musk's latest venture. He believes that artificial intelligence is going to get ahead of the human race, and that if we don't figure out some way to make our brains smarter, and interface with artificial intelligence directly to our brains that we're gonna be lost as an, an organism on this earth. Well, it's a crazy thought, but you know, Elon Musk has a lot of crazy ideas. Some of, uh, some of them have actually demonstrated uh, some very interesting things. So Neuralink is, is uh, building electrode designs, flexible electrodes. Uh, they're putting in thousands of electrodes rather than 10 or 20. Uh, here's a rat with 3,000 channels on it. They've built a robot that can surgically place these. Uh, uh, the, the robot does all the work at placing them. And uh, so we don't know whether this is gonna take us very far, but the technology is really exciting. So, uh, and um, the, one of the challenges, the big challenges for all of this, and actually moving it into clinical populations, is the, uh, the FDA, the, the Federal Drug Administration, because you know, these devices are so-called class three medical devices that could cause harm. Uh, they go through a really rigorous approval to get an interventional device exemption to be able to place them in humans. Now, there are some uh, times when the FDA allows an exception and they've actually done that for vision, for example. And there's a company called Second Sight, some of you may have heard about, that developed an Argus retinal implant. And um, to get through the FDA, I, I realized that the first time I talked to one of the people from Second Sight, guess what technology they used? Did they invent a new technology to stimulate the retina? Well, eventually, but the first implant in humans, those were cochlear implant devices. They were, because they were already approved, they were able to accelerate their clinical research. So uh, this is a, a real big hurdle and it costs lots of money. So a lot of people are trying to go non-invasive with either uh, something called transcranial magnetic stimulation 
or transcranial direct current stimulation, which is basically two uh, electrodes or turning your brain into a battery. But uh, it wasn't all that unique since uh, Captain Picard, if any of you are uh, uh, fans of r watching old reruns of uh, sci-fi, uh, will show you uh, Captain Picard had a, a neural stimulator implanted uh, uh, sometime in the future. Uh, there are also technologies coming down the pike that uh, are very interesting, such as transcranial pulsed ultrasound, uh, which uh, the, it's, it's basically the same technology that's used to ablate tumors, but those create heat. That's how they uh, ablate tumors, for example, in the abdomen. Lower the intensity, focus uh, the, uh, the energy, and you can stimulate deep in the brain without actually penetrating the brain. Those are uh, just now coming along. So I want to show you a, a video of someone that actually this lady had a stroke. She had a large pontine stroke. But this is the same technology that's being uh, uh, used in uh, a, a number of humans with spinal cord injury as well. And um, this, uh, this lady, this is the first time that she was guiding a robot with thoughts in her brain. And uh, so she actually guided that robot through her brain signals from her motor cortex to uh, move the cup, and she was able to sip it for the first time in years since she had this pontine stroke, and she has no movement below the level of the neck. And you could see the looks on people's faces. I had the pleasure of meeting this lady a few years ago, and my burning question was, um, was that difficult? I mean, it just seems like, I mean, you're, you're controlling a robot rather than your own limbs. So the algorithm is completely different. There are a limited number of channels. We can't implant the, uh, the 100 billion cells in our brains. So again, it's just you're extracting a part of that signal. Um, and um, so uh, she would, uh, and I asked her whether it was difficult at first, and she said, she paused and she had a speller, a device that could allow her to spell uh, with her uh, visual signals. And um, she said, it's natural. And I was just blown away that something that seems so artificial, just like the cochlear implant, the brain figured it out. So uh, there are some amazing things that, uh, that we still need to understand about the brain. Uh, uh, one of the future technologies that we developed is a system that uses, um, it's, we call it activity-dependent stimulation, that uses information from one part of the brain to stimulate another part. Um, and it's, uh, so it, it's an adaptive stimulation. So we're getting the br one part of the brain to talk to another part. One system that's actually in, in clinical use right now is something called Neuropace, uh, the, this company. Uh, uses this to turn off epileptic seizures when they're detected on one part of the brain surface. It stimulates another part of the brain to effectively turn off the seizure. And uh, my dogs are barking because I'm over time, but I'm going to show you a quick video of uh, what this looks like. Uh, this is something that Dr. Klein actually does in his lab uh, and has uh, rats uh, reaching for little pellets to test their motor skills. They're really good at this, and that's just, we'll play over and over again. But a colleague of mine and I uh, designed this uh, application-specific integrated circuit that takes information from the sensory part of the brain that's receiving the muscle and skin senses uh, and connected it to one of the motor outputs. So one of the, this animal's motor cortex is destroyed, and one thing that happens is that you get all these disconnections in the brain after brain damage. It's not the, as I said, it's not just a, uh, a normal brain with a hole in it. So we've now hooked up this device that records action potentials from individual neurons and then stimulates uh, the motor cortex to reintegrate the signal. Again, we're not trying to reproduce the normal movements, we're trying to get the two parts of the brain to talk to each other again. And this is with the device off, so this animal is just like an animal that's untreated. Uh, he uh, cannot retrieve the pellet, uh, very poor at it. And then on the right, this is the same animal about three minutes later when we turn the device on and link these two uh, areas, the sensory and motor areas. Um, and it has to be time-locked. 
it has to depend upon those signals from the muscles and joints, and they stimulate the cortex. If it's just random stimulation, there's no effect, uh, or very, very little effect. So um, uh, these devices, these adaptive devices, are being used in many applications. This is from uh, Ted Berger at USC, who's trying to adapt such a device to the hippocampus, an important area of the brain that's involved in uh, cognitive processes and spatial navigation. So we have lots of challenges, and, and um, the, the main one is, uh, and this will wrap it up, the, um, to record from the brain, we can either put uh, electrodes deep into the brain, record from individual neurons, that's very invasive, uh, recording from neurons over a lifetime is not yet uh, practical. Uh, or we can record from uh, the dura, lower frequency, lower fidelity signals um, uh, that we call, some, uh, some of these are called local field potentials. Or we could record from the surface, totally non-invasive. But as you get further and further away, it's like trying to understand the conversation that's going on on the, on the football field between the quarterback and his players when they're in a huddle when the crowd is roaring and you're listening to roaring crowds from an airplane. And that's sort of what we can do with EEG. And well, maybe we can extract those signals, but it's not like being there uh, and monitoring every individual. So those are big challenges. But again, the brain is, uh, is quite uh, adaptive. There are a lot of initiatives uh, through uh, federal government for the Brain Initiative. And um, i j just leave you with this. Uh, I talked about Neuralink, uh, but as a disclosure, we, were ac we actually invented a company called Neuralink to develop that device that I showed you that we put into the rats. Um, I still have a cap and business cards. I sent them to Elon Musk. and haven't got a response yet uh, on, on Twitter, uh, and, uh, and I know he uses Twitter. So at least we got, for MIT Tech Review, if you look at, uh, look at that, there's an article about the guys that uh, sold Elon Musk. We didn't even know it was him that bought the name. But um, this is a, a really exciting field. Um, I think um, anybody that wants to go into neuroengineering to uh, try to interface electronics with the brain there, it's going to be exciting your whole life because uh, we've, we've really just scratched the surface. And um, there is so much more to do. Uh, so uh, I hope you have enjoyed the talk and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Welcome again. I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Sarah Hoyt. I will be moderating uh, your questions and the questions we've been fielding from our YouTube chat, uh, along with a few of my own. Um, I lead a faculty development grant um, here through FSE. So thank you, and thank you, Dr. Um, again, if you are joining us live, you can use the paper that you got upon registration to text any questions that you have, and I will be able to pull those up here on my end. So, while we're doing that. And while we're doing that, in case any of you enjoy public speaking, there are only two rules for public speaking, and uh, my uh, major professor taught me this long ago, and that is you can never be too simple nor too brief. I think I may have failed at least one of those, but uh, <laughs> we'll uh, hopefully have time for questions. Great. So first question, what motivated you to pursue this field? Well, I, um, I uh, was brought up uh, by a father who was a, um, a technician, electronics technician. He repaired TVs, and so I was always fascinated by uh, you know, fixing televisions and what component was, was bad. And uh, as soon as I got into uh, electrical engineering, um, and there was not at that time a field of bioengineering or neural engineering as there is now, or I probably would have gone that path. But I got really excited about my psychology classes and sociology of deviant behavior and what makes people think the way they do. And uh, so those became fascinating. And so I actu actually ended up pursuing life sciences, getting a degree in uh, biology and neuroscience. 
but I come back to it all the time because it's a really, even though it's it, uh, the most exciting thing about the brain is that it's the most complex uh, machinery that one can imagine. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm never bored with, uh, with understanding the brain and because in my lifetime I know that all the answers will not be known. Well, and I think you displayed an excellent example of how, especially with these grand challenges, it really takes kind of that interdisciplinary approach to tackling some of these larger Exactly. Issues. I think we can't live in a vacuum, and I think especially right now, uh, neuroscience and engineering are, are so critical. And then we have to understand also from the clinician's side. One of the mistakes I think people make is that well, you know, I'm a great engineer. I've studied signal processing, and uh, I can I can figure out some new code that the brain is using. But um, you really need to think about, if, especially if you're interested in neurological damage and actually repairing damaged brains, that you understand the people that you're trying to help, and what what is it that that is critical to them. And if if you do it in a vacuum you'll invent something really cool and maybe it'll spin off into uh, a useful uh, technology. But if you, don't, uh, if you don't really know who uh, you're working for, uh, rather than just the pursuit of knowledge, uh, I think it can lead you astray. So I think it's very important this interdisciplinary team include uh, people with disabilities that uh, are brought into the fold and we understand their, their issues. That's great. Um, you mentioned the, the code, the brain's code. Um, what technological advances do you feel would need to occur that will kind of allow us to further decipher the brain's communication? And I, I, and I think that there are a lot of thoughts about this and, and people, and, I, and I, I don't know what Musk is doing behind the scenes, so I can't really speak for him, but I, it, it seems that it's, a, it's very much an engineering approach uh, to increase the number of channels, get uh, it's a reductionist approach to truly re, uh, reverse engineer the brain where we're trying to get at the finest grain uh, to record and stimulate. That will be very exciting if, if we can pull that off, but it may not give us the answers. We don't really know what those codes are. There are probably fractal harmonics of any code that you imagine that are replicated throughout the brain, and a lot of people think that well, maybe that reverse engineering means that we can understand that code at a, you know, some harmonic level above what the lower level processes are doing and actually affect changes in the brain uh, uh, by even maybe even recording externally. We don't know the answer to that yet. And so I think that, uh, that this is what, these are the, really the biggest challenge and what all of you need to be very creative about it, anybody that wants to go into brain sciences and neural engineering to, uh, to really think creatively about what, what is that code? What's the temporal uh, uh, dimensions of that code, the spatial dimensions, the, uh, and where does that intersect with the actual behavior? And we're, we're still very far from that. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um. So switching gears a little bit, is it possible to address damage that has affected a person's personality following a traumatic brain injury? Sure, and I think we, we do things like sensory systems, like reproducing uh, sound in the brain, and, and even uh, to the extent that we can, we're really good at controlling robots now, people are getting better and better, and we can do the motor side uh, uh, fairly well, at least autonomously, uh, and, and so thinking about exoskeletons and those things are really within the realm of possibility. When we start thinking about emotional and cognitive disorders, personality disorders, again, it's, it's a more complex issue. There are some deep brain stimulation techniques and even the transcranial uh, non-invasive techniques that we know now that, that, that are approved for, for example, depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, but you know, it, it's still, it, it, we're, we're one step beyond where we were, you know, 50 years ago, people were giving frontal lobotomies and uh, an electroconvulsive shock. Uh, still, electroconvulsive shock is, still has its place in the clinics. Now we're getting more refined and using these non-invasive fo focal stimulation techniques, but it's still very far from uh, you know, individual patient treatment. 
So we, uh, again, I don't, I don't want to um, uh, really make you think that, it, that all is lost, we can't do this, but th those, uh, we're gonna go in stages, and I think we're, we're getting there with sensory and motor disorders, but we have uh, much further to go with uh, personality disorders. Right. Um, so what are some of the ethical implications of the technology connected to this as we develop? Yeah, and those, those are huge. And uh, I, again, thinking about a team, uh, I, I don't think anyone should or, or could do all of this on their own. And I think having ethicists actually as part of uh, learning how to use these devices. I mean, think about it. I mean, it, it makes sense. It's really easy to make a case that someone with a stroke or spinal cord injury, I have a, an experimental approach that we think might work, and the FDA has has a, approved to place it in the first human, uh, that uh, that might be reasonable. But thinking about normal brains that are not injured, and um, you know, so-called hacking into normal brains to make us smarter, um, is that should we be doing that? What what does that mean for what does it be, mean to be a human if you have electronics uh, implanted in your brain to make you calculate uh, faster and do differential equations in microseconds? Um, you know that's what people are talking about, and, and we really have to think about what that what that really means uh, before we, we we jump into this. Um, and are the, the uh, back to the second site retinal uh, implants. One of the the questions that, um, the, that those leaders in that company uh, uh, were asked when the, the FDA wanted to decide whether they would, um, uh, they would put this device onto the retinas of large numbers of people, they talked to the people that had the first devices and they said, okay, you've got this device in one eye. What if you went blind in that eye, completely blind? you still have a little bit of a residual vision. This, this device is making your vision a little bit better. What if you went completely blind because of the device? Would you put it in your other eye? And this person didn't hesitate. They said, absolutely, because the, the gains that they got with their vision in that one eye was so uh, powerful that, um, that they were willing to do it. So we really have to under, uh, uh, think through this and have ethicists on, on board any kind of uh, um, uh, decisions about implanting these devices. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so how else can the technologies that you kind of discuss benefit society? Um, are there benefits beyond addressing this damage or are there other areas where this could kind of? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, um, it certainly has uh, spurred a lot of interest in, uh, in robotics, for example, and I think a lot of that we borrowed from, uh, you know, from industry, and still the robots that we have today that we try to slap on to the bodies of people with brain injuries are are pretty heavy and bulky, and they're not they're really designed to move uh, paint guns, and you know they, uh, you have to worry about uh, injury from these devices, not only to the individual but to others around them. So uh, so there's a lot of interest now. That, that's being spent on um, uh, less costly and lighter weight components for exoskeletons for, for individuals. So there, I think there, there will be um, uh, just the, the whole engineering side of robotics, m uh, some type of micro robotic systems will be uh, probably benefited from, from these, uh, these approaches. Great. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about transcranial pulsed ultrasound and why it's so important? Well, the, the, the one thing that we can do with these external stimulating devices like repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, they're really good for stimulating the surface of the brain, but they don't penetrate deep into the brain, such as that structure where we put the electrode for deep brain stimulation. So. Uh, just stimulating the surface is, you know, that, that's, that really limits us. If we can do that effectively and stimulate parts of the brain and non-invasively, uh, it really limits us if we can't go deep. So this, uh, this focused ultrasound could allow uh, structures deep within the brain to be specifically stimulated. Um, and um, uh, so they, they could really 
extend uh, the reach of all these systems uh, quite a bit and allow us to, to do non-invasive uh, uh, stimulation in, um, uh, uh, for many, many other disorders. Um, what are your thoughts on infrared neural stimulation as a non-invasive procedure and the possibility for its uses to better detect epilepsy? Um, uh, this is a, a, a technique I'm not so familiar with, and I, I will admit when I, uh, uh, when I don't know a technique, but the infrared stimulation, uh, uh, there are some, uh, uh, I, I think the way I understand it, that it, it may not be uh, so specific. I mean, we really have to think about that balance between specificity and uh, broad uh, um, uh, stimulation, just bathing uh, the brain in infrared. Um, and it, you know, you have to think about penetration of tissue. What kinds of wavelengths will penetrate into the tissue? There's a lot of excitement about optical stimulation uh, now. Uh, instead of using uh, electrical cables to stimulate uh, at the interface, which has some issues. There are actually genetically modified mice that have uh, uh, channel rhodopsins embedded in their membranes, and you can literally just shine a certain wavelength of light and depolarize uh, their membranes, uh, activate them with light. And so there, there's actually uh, some uh, some thought that, and you can actually use a different wavelength uh, to, to inhibit those cells with a, a different kind of uh, rhodopsin. And so um, a lot of people are, are looking at uh, ways that we can, uh, instead of metal electrodes uh, in, in the brain, actually use some type of fiber optics to turn on and off cells uh, more specifically. But infrared, I, th I think the way I understand it, it it's, it's a bit more general, and I don't know that it will have um, the kind of effects that, I'm not sure that we understand its mechanisms. Okay. Um, another audience question. TDCS uses low voltage to cause low level plastic changes in the brain. How do we know it's not simply affecting the cranial nerves up through the brain stem? And is there a known mechanism? Are there advantages of using NeuroPACE over TMS or TDCS? Well, TDCS is kind of interesting because it's so, it's so simple. I mean, it's, you're, it's basically two battery terminals. You've got an anode and a cathode, and, uh, and the only uh, risk issues, if you go above about four milliamps, you'll start burning the skin. So obviously, it's having some, some impact on skin sens uh, sensors. And so that, that makes it a little uh, a, a funky in terms of dissecting out, well, what, what's the cause and effect here? And uh, it, because it's so easy, everybody's doing it. People are doing it, and uh, you can buy the, these things on the, on the internet pretty cheap. And uh, so uh, I think a lot of people in the field, including me, uh, are a bit skeptical of this approach, that it does anything. So one of the things we did, actually, with TDCS, we went into the laboratory and uh, uh, put these TDCS-like electrodes, sized everything to rat size, uh, and did current density modeling to show that it's about the same as a human, and uh, just let rats walk around, and um, we could not detect any change in neural activity when the TDCS was on. We had to get up to damaging levels of current before we saw real effects. So I, I think it's effects, if it has any, which I'm still skeptical, there are lots of papers out there. You'll read lots of studies with TDCS and, the, and effects uh, are shown, but um, they're not easily replicated. And so I, I think that, uh, that particular, um, uh, the, the current is uh, shunted through the skin and the mm -hmm. skull. And so the actual current that gets down to the brain is, uh, is really hard to predict. Uh, so I, I, I think it's, uh, it, we'll see what happens with it, but there, uh, there's a lot of skepticism in the field right now about that approach. So what would you tell a college sen senior, excuse me, with interest in neuroengineering, neuroplasticity, neural networks, um, but lacks expertise in electronics and neuroscience? Um, 
I think that there are some really uh, uh, concrete things that, that you can do, and uh, probably a lot of them you're already doing, and learning all the math that you can, uh, learning MATLAB programming, no, no plug for the company uh, intended, uh, but um, uh, signal processing and, um, and understanding uh, both digital and analog electronics, and understanding neurobiology. So it's it, not so hard, and you really have to uh, almost get two, two PhDs to, to really grasp this field, or if you don't want to have two PhDs, you uh, decide that you're going to focus on one area, and you're going you're gonna to find a team of other people that are interested in this fascinating topic, and each one of them has their own specialty and complements the other. Because uh, it, it really is too large to, to understand everything. Uh, but as far as neuroengineering, um, all, of that, all of that math and uh, signal processing uh, theory is really going to help. So just a couple things. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is the most interesting part of your research? Um, while studying the brain, have you found anything that shocked you? Um, well, I, you know, the, the, the first time we, um, you know, a lot of times things don't work in the laboratory, and um, we, we spent years building a, a device uh, to you know, do what uh, we discussed with the rats and integrate two parts of the brain. But seeing it actually work is another story. And the first time my graduate student brought me into the lab, and uh, he's and said, watch this, and you know, he turned the device on and the rat's uh, reaching normally and he turn it off and he's uh, falling apart again. I almost jumped and hit the ceiling. I couldn't believe it. So you know, some of those moments are, are really exciting uh, when you, uh, you discover something uh, really new so, uh, that you've learned. And I guess this is what really got me ex really excited uh, uh, about uh, neuroscience long ago that when you realize that you're the first person on the planet that's actually seen this result, I don't care how trivial it is, how small the jigsaw puzzle piece is, that you're the first one that's to see it. I mean, that, that really gives you goosebumps, and it, it, it still does to me every time my students bring me new things like that. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm shocked all the time at, at, at what uh, smart students come up with uh, and especially if they don't just copy what I did, if they, they try to do something really new and out of the box. That's great. Um, one student shares, I have a parent who lost their eyesight due to a stabbing in which her optic nerve was damaged. What are the applications of this technology for vision signal processing or blindness? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think it will, uh, down the road, I think there's a, there's a lot of applications. Currently, it's limited to one disease called retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, so they're uh, s similar to cochlear implants. The, if the, uh, the peripheral anatomy is still intact, uh, the auditory nerve is still intact, the optic nerve is still intact, it, it's a simpler, story than a, a, having a nerve that's partially degenerated. But I'm not saying we won't get there, but it's just, it's another leap forward that has to occur in the technology. I, you know, that I showed you the picture of that nerve and our current uh, electrode designs. Uh, they're not going to be, be able to replicate uh, <coughs> the signals in each one of those nerve fibers. But hopefully we won't have to. Uh, the, you know, I, I keep saying this, it sounds like a very simple mantra, but I, I think the brain will figure it out. <coughs> and we just have to be smart <coughs> about uh, uh, sending in the right elements and the right timing uh, for the brain to, to understand our language. <laughs> okay. Do the advances in this study <clears throat> make some techniques or devices more available or more cost efficient for individual consumers? Um, yeah, the, <coughs> in, uh, certainly that's happened with the, uh, the, the, the kinds of devices like deep brain stimulation that have, been, uh, uh, that have been out for a very long time. The cochlear implants are coming down in price. But for example, the, um, uh, the second sight system, the last I looked, the, the cost of that device 
uh, alone, um, and this doesn't include the surgery or all the training that goes <coughs> on. You just don't slap these devices on your retina and automatically you can see again. You actually have to train your brain to see with these artificial signals. Uh, it's about $150,000. So um, uh, it's not something that, uh, that everybody can just uh, go out and buy. Um, <coughs> now, as these things uh, become more proven, like the deep brain stimulation, now insurance companies are, are willing to foot a lot of the cost. Uh, and so um, you can get some of, those, uh, some of those things paid for. But with new devices that are just coming out, it's, it's, very, uh, it's extremely expensive. And it's primarily due to the research and development that, um, you know, I, the device that we had, just, just to give you an idea, um, that little ASIC chip, and we still have to do things like figure out how to encapsulate <coughs> it properly so we can put it in the brain. Uh, just to get that device through the FDA uh, and to do all the engineering to show them that it's safe and we can put it into humans, um, $15, 20000000 million would probably do it. So, you know, that's an Elon Musk level project. It's not a uh, early startup project. So these things are, are, are really costly at first until they have wide application. Okay. So as we are getting near the end here, I would like to end with a call to action, um, asking others, you all, to get involved. Um, I'm definitely confident that you have certainly inspired some people here today to do that. Um, so what do you think would be some first steps to kind of provide for the audience to address some of these challenges that you described today? Well, I think, you know, there, there are, uh, if you don't know anything about um, uh, the, uh, the brain other, uh, other than basic um, uh, information about neurons and axons and dendrites, and if you don't know that, I mean, there are some things that, that are fairly easy to grasp. And uh, just, uh, and, it, and they're probably one of them that's, that's probably the most relevant. If I, if I go to the FDA, the first thing they're gonna ask me is electrode tissue interface. What is it? What kind of electrode are you using that's already approved? So thinking about that whole idea of uh, uh, where, where do we make contact? What kind of materials are best to use to listen to some information of the brain. Um, and um, is that metal? I don't know. Uh, is it uh, uh, some kind of optical interface? Is it some, uh, something maybe that we haven't even thought of? Maybe we need to go down, instead of looking at these action potentials, which are the, each neuron depolarizing, maybe we need to get even finer grain and look at individual ion channels. So, what, what tools are there for looking at some of these basic uh, neural processes uh, that is out in the world? Look at, look at other fields. And uh, this is one thing we do quite a bit in the lab is not just narrowly focus on what everybody else is doing with tissue electrode interface uh, in neurobiology, because it's all gonna be the same pretty much. Let's go into another area and, of biology and uh, you will find uh, some novel things. He said, well, that couldn't work for brain interfacing, but maybe it could. And so start, start thinking about uh, knowledge, uh, no matter how basic, that you find in other <coughs> fields, um, and um, it, that it may have some uh, great relevance. And it could be something that can be tested in a dish, uh, that we can really start working on um, uh, the actual biophysics of how some of this interfacing works. So there, there's, a, there's a whole range of levels of analysis that you can get into, but I, look to other fields. Uh, don't just be so insular that you look at your own. Well, thank you very much. That's all the time we have for today. Um, that was excellent. Yeah, thank very you very much. much. Appreciate it. Um, Please check out our website for more information on future events on this NAE Grand Challenge speaker series. And again, audience, please join me in thanking Dr. Nudo for his